Hey everybody, so I wanna share some insights that I had. Um, this has been about a week or two weeks ago. Uh, speaking to a, a, a younger man who I, I kind of mentor from time to time. Um, he self-identifies as a borderline, but he has not been diagnosed. I personally don't think he fully fits the profile of somebody with borderline personality disorder. However, I do believe that he kind of fits that more generic profile of someone who is cluster B, not otherwise specified. Um, I think he's got traits from both the borderline and the narcissistic side of things. Uh, and I'll get into that briefly. Um, but we had conversations about the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial and things that resonated with him from the Amber Heard side. Um, and we came to some interesting conclusions and I want to share those. So perhaps the, the, um, first I'll tell you a little bit about him just briefly. Uh, he's in his thirties and he, uh, it strikes me as the type of male borderline who uh, uh, tries to mitigate emotional damage uh, through self-improvement. So he's very big into the whole alpha male thing, the alpha male strategies and pickup arts and being a player and all of these different things. Uh, and he has pretty much grown out of it now. Um, and in part from the conversations that we had where I pointed out to him, I said, don't you feel like you're basically just in Groundhog's Day? Like you think that, you, that you're that you a player and that you're a ladies man and all this stuff. But it, at the end of the day, it's a lot like Groundhog Day where you find yourself in a state of perpetually introducing yourself to new people. And when you look at the long-term history of it, what did you get for all that time? You never, you never established any long-term valuable relationships that have a return on your investment, right? It was all just expenditure and for what, right? So you've got to, it's not about quantity, right? So that's a little bit about him. Uh, when we discussed the Amber Heard trial, there was uh, something that really stuck out to him. And it was something that I had pointed out, I think on a previous video. And that was the recording where she's telling Johnny, uh, you know, no Johnny, you don't escape the fight. You escape the solution. You escape the solution. How are we supposed to solve anything when you keep running from the fight? We can't solve it. We can't work through it. And he's, that resonated strongly with him. He's like, that drives me nuts. Like when, when, I'm having a fight or an argument with somebody and they just want to leave. They just want to leave everything unresolved. And so you know, his question to me was, well, why is that? And we talked a little bit and here's, um, here's what we figured out. Uh, people who are cluster B when they're having a fight or an argument, uh, especially when it's something ideological, ideologically based, they tend to want to turn it into a debate, not a conversation, not a discussion. See, there's more than one way to interact uh, person to person, like a one-on-one -on -one -to -one interaction, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, conversations is one, uh, discussions is one, and a debate is one. And for the people who uh, ha are high in trait narcissism, the debate format is appealing uh, to narcissism because we see that on media, we see that on, on TV, on YouTube, all the, the great debates over things, right? You got two people representing two opposing ideas and may the best ideas win. And on the you know person on one side represents all the people who feel that way. And the person on the other side represents all the people who feel that way. And it's a rock'em sock'em battle of ideas. And you know, may the best idea win. And what I told him, I said, you've got to understand that the debate format works great for cultural and societal ideas, right? That, that are conflicting with each other. It's actually the least effective, poorest model to use for one-to-one -one interactions. Why? Because a debate is inherently 
combative inherently you overlook that because for you it's right and you want to be right and you want to have like the right idea and you want to represent the correct idea to the best of your ability and that's fine uh, but the the actual purpose of a debate the only reason the debate exists is specifically for combat of ideas and if somebody's not really feeling like going to battle for an idea they're not going to appreciate it when you take a conversation and hijack it into a debate you know you i say this on the channels from time to time you have to learn to be okay with someone being wrong Right? You gotta learn to be okay with it. You don't always have to correct somebody when they're wrong. Um, in fact, sometimes you shouldn't. And um, he didn't understand that at first. I said, okay, right? You come from a different background than I do. Everybody comes from a different background. Imagine you go to like a college or a school or, or an art class, right? And you have a whole classroom full of students. And they're all painting the same bowl of apples at the front of the classroom right um you're going to have you say you have 12 students you're going to have 12 unique paintings of the same thing so they're all the same thing but they are all unique and different you're not going to have any two paintings that are the same you can't pick up one painting and pick one painting and point at everybody else and say all y'all's paintings are wrong because this one is the correct one right this, you can't do that and it's like well what if they you know, what if they painted the like okay he said well what if they painted uh purple apples right that that would be an example of it wrong i was like well, what if they're colorblind and he goes oh so yeah there might be some there might be a hidden reason that you don't know about right and you're going to shred and destroy relationships and friendships by wanting to pick up the debate as your as your go-to uh, model of interaction, right? So you don't want to do that. And so I, I think that's one reason why it's so frustrating to talk to Cluster B people, um, especially when it's over something contentious like you know COVID or masks. God, that was that was hell, right? Um, you know, but uh, things like politics or Ukraine or um, you know, it, whatever, whatever the conflict of the day is going to be, right? Um, they're going to be, uh, struggling with that. And then it, the conversation led to the, to another interesting area. And that was, um, the relationship with his brother. He had a younger brother, uh, who was, is overly, the overly sensitive type, um, easily hurt, easily damaged, um, and you know, he was always trying to build his brother up and, and get his brother to be tough and, and show him the way. Right. And all he got was kicked back, you know, from his brother, um, who will no longer speak to him. And he's like, dude, you got to understand, dude, I just don't want you to be a P word. Right. He's like, you're a P word. Like I'm, I'm trying to build you up. I'm trying to help you. Right. And he's like, and he just says that I'm abusing him, but I'm not. He's just overly sensitive and says that I'm abusing him. And I said, well, let's take a step back for a minute, though. And I said, you, you take a look at the law in this country, right? So it's your intent is not to abuse him, right? And subjectively, you might be being very gentle with your brother, right? But he is telling you what he is telling you. His feedback to you about your behavior is that you are coming across as abusive, and that may very well be because you always default to the most combative interaction style that one could ever pick, right? So anytime you come around and start talking, it's automatically going to be a fight because in your mind, it's combat for the correct idea. Well, people just don't have that kind of energy most of the time. Uh, eventually, people are just going to choose to conserve their own energy and spend it on something more productive than disagreeing with you, right? But you take a look at other areas of life, right? So not, let's just say, not even interpersonal relationships or relationships at all. Let's take a look at the law and what the law says, right? When, 
when you have good intentions, but but through no fault of your own, damages are incurred. Uh, you accidentally cause serious damage or harm. Things like involuntary manslaughter, for example. Manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter, and the list goes on. You didn't mean to kill someone, but you still killed someone. Somebody is dead be because of you. You didn't mean it, but we've still seen it fit to give the, the fam those who you damaged to put you in front of a jury and decide whether or not you should be held criminally liable, right? So just by society and convention of society and the way that we've written the law, we've seen fit to be able to take somebody to court over, a, over very, very similar circumstances, right? So maybe you're intending to help your brother, but you're unknowingly or unwittingly or uncaringly still causing damage or harm, and you think that you shouldn't be, but it is. Uh, yeah, man, like, even though you're not meaning to harm him or damage him, you're still doing it, and that's, that's what he's trying to tell you. And you have the audacity to disagree with them. Like, I don't know, like, just from listening to you tell it from, and this is, understand, I'm getting this from your side, right? This is how you describe it. This, this isn't even from me talking to him or taking his side. This is what I'm literally hearing from you. See, when somebody says, I don't like what you're doing, please stop what you're doing. That's, that's a cue to, to stop what you're doing instead of justifying it to it, ju providing a justification to continue to do the problematic behavior. Because I know for sure you and all of the alpha male doing your alpha mailing, you wouldn't tolerate that shit. Not for one second. Like somebody wants to come up and, and, and start pressing you, uh, challenging you and your authority, right? You would immediately not tolerate it, right? Back off or I'll back you up, Right? If you don't quit, I will make you quit. Right? But then subjectively, right, when it's when it's your brother, when it's somebody who in your eyes is a lesser male, does it to you, you tell them to shut up and deal with it because you believe that that's what an alpha male does. And this is where I corrected him. I said, if you, so, and just modeling it from the alpha male ideology, and I've spoken about these things before, I don't actually subscribe to alpha male and beta male or sigma or gamma. Right. I think that it just points to a, a broader concept of maturity. Right. An alpha male is simply the most mature male in a given room or a given group of people within a given context. So whoever is most mature, most developed in a given area, it's exactly that. It's the most mature person in the room. Right. But it's still useful to use those terms. OK, because they represent a, a hierarchical structure. Right. So. When I use these terms for what I'm about to say, understand that that's generally where I'm coming from, okay? Right? You want to be the alpha male, right? You want to be the most alpha, you know, the, the alpha, the alpha, right? Because you're saying, I don't have time for that beta male bullshit. I was like, well, well, you better make time for it, right? Because what is the alpha male? They're at the top of the hierarchy. Well, if there's nobody beneath you on the hierarchy then you're just kind of off alone. And there's a term for that. It's the sigma male or the gamma male. And chances are it's, it's, not, it's not the appealing one, right? Part of being an alpha male is learning to bring in the betas underneath your wings and learning to be okay with it and advocating on their behalf and having relationships and interactions with them. Because if there's no hierarchy, then it's, it's, it's literally impossible for you to be an alpha male. So you better learn to make time for the, the quote-unquote beta males. You better make time for the beta male bullshit. And you better learn, how to have, better learn how to have relationships with them. And beneficial quality friendships. Right? Because then otherwise... You're really not an alpha male. You're just alone lying to yourself. And I think that, that, that really hit home. So 
I just wanted to provide all of these insights just from the mind of someone who, I, as I said in the beginning, I, I, I think he's definitely, uh, it shows, shows uh, traits within uh, Cluster B. I don't, I, I wouldn't say that he's, like I said in the beginning, I wouldn't call him BBD and I wouldn't call him NPD. I'd call him just a, 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 a somewhere in between, this nebulous mix of the two. Maybe with some histrionics because of the whole alpha male thing and, and you know, Jim doing the GTL, Jim Tan and Laundry stuff. Um, whatever, right? He's just, just somewhere in there. But, uh, you know, it was a, it was a long, hours long conversation and I'm not going to retell every little detail. But I, I think this gives y'all a, a pretty good, uh, pretty good insight and uh i'll leave it at that yeah so as always you know please like i, I always love to to you know, hear from you guys sound off in the comments let me know if any of this resonates with you i know that some of the stuff i've covered in the past um but you know repeat never hurts anyways i'll see you guys on the next video